Hi everyone, welcome to Volcano Tuesdays. Thank you so much for joining us live. I'm really excited to be reporting this week at a very special spot right in front of the volcano, Mount St. Helens behind me. My name is Gina and I work as an educator with the Mount St. Helens Institute. We are a nonprofit that teaches about the science and stories of Mount St. Helens. We hope to inspire your curiosity and questions about volcanoes through this series. Volcano Tuesdays includes live demonstrations of hands-on fun activities that you can do at home. These are aired weekly on Tuesdays at 11 Pacific time and each week includes a set of challenges for things for you to try on your own and send to us. Each week we like to highlight our challenges. Tell us more about what makes you curious about volcanoes and what you hope to learn. If you're tuning in from our website or from YouTube, look for the link to submit your feedback to us. Last week we learned about the chemistry of magma beneath the surface and how this affects the style of eruption that we see from volcanoes. Some eruptions are explosive, like the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens, and some eruptions are less explosive. Today we are going to think about how volcanoes build themselves into tall mountains through the buildup of successive eruptions. We are going to focus on how one volcano in particular, Mount St. Helens, grew over a long period of time into the imposing over 8,000 foot tall volcano it is today. Today we're going to learn about the past eruptive history of Mount St. Helens by building together a timeline of important events or milestones in the life of this volcano. You can follow along and draw your own timeline or pause the video at any time to gather your supplies. A supply list is listed on our website. Our challenges today are for you to create your, create your own set of timelines. Let's begin by thinking about the purpose of a timeline. A timeline is one way to model what has occurred in the past. Timelines can be created to represent the history of a volcano like Mount St. Helens or the history of a person like you or me. Let's start by drawing a timeline to represent the history of a person. Gather your drawing supplies or use the worksheet on our website to draw your own timeline. To make a timeline, I'm first going to start with a horizontal line. I read my timeline from left to right. I'm going to mark the left side as past and mark the right side as future. Thus, as I read my timeline from left to right, I will move from the past towards the future. Notice the arrow at the end of the right side of the timeline pointing to the future. Not all timelines need to have an arrow. In this case, the arrow symbolizes the direction that time is moving. The arrow also symbolizes that my timeline represents events that will continue into the future. Next, I'm going to mark a few events or milestones that are important in the history of this imaginary person. First, I'll mark where this person was born, that this person lost their first tooth, and then that this person learned how to swim. Each of these events occurred at a specific time, and so I'm going to mark my timeline to capture the correct distances between these events. I'm next going to draw tick marks on the timeline evenly spaced to represent different intervals of time. Each tick mark is five years apart. Thus, I can see that events that happened in this person's life did not all happen at once, nor were they evenly spaced apart. Notice how time advances from left to right, moving from older dates to more recent dates, and then with the arrow continuing into the future. We are now going to think about the history of the volcano Mount St. Helens in a similar way. Let's begin with the oldest known rocks that have erupted from Mount St. Helens. Note that the further back in time we go, the more difficult it is to piece together the story of what happened. Much like if I'm making a timeline of, say, what I had for breakfast, and I want to go back in time in the last month, it's harder for me to remember what I had for breakfast maybe a month ago than it is for me to remember what I had for breakfast this morning. To make our timeline, we're going to do a huge time travel back in time to head back almost 50,000 years ago. We are going to draw what scientists imagine Mount St. Helens might have looked like during its first eruptive phases. 
I'm going to use a set of colored paper and some markers to draw out these profiles of the shape of the mountain. You can draw alongside me or pause this video to get some supplies or just draw things on your own for fun as we go. I would like to note that geologists often name rocks based on the names of pre-existing towns where the rock units are originally found. Rock and ash created by this first phase of the eruption of Mount St. Helens was identified near a place today called Ape Canyon. Other units that we'll talk about at Mount St. Helens are named for other places such as Cougar and Kalama. So let's work on making this timeline together. We're going to begin by drawing the shape of Mount St. Helens as it has changed through time through the various eruptions that have built it into the volcano that we recognize today. The Ape Canyon phase is the longest eruptive phase of Mount St. Helens and lasted for over 15,000 years. Eruptions were spread out, perhaps as far as 5,000 years apart. Eruptions during this time produced a set of lava domes that piled on top of one another, creating a mountain estimated to be approximately 4,000 feet tall. This was an explosive time for our baby volcano. Between this stage and the next eruptive stage, Mount St. Helens lay dormant for approximately 15,000 years. During the cougar eruptive phase, the volcano again extruded many lava domes and lava flows that built up the height of the volcano to more than 6,000 feet. This phase included many explosive eruptions and also included one of the largest lava flows in the history of the volcano. The next eruptive phase is called the Swift Creek phase. Eruptions during this period created many lava domes, which built up and also broke apart in large pyroclastic flows of hot ash and pumice that washed down the flanks of the volcano. During this time, Mount St. Helens also erupted large amounts of ash. The height of the volcano grew to over 7,000 feet. The next phase is called the Smith Creek phase. After a pause of almost 5,000 years, Mount St. Helens became active again during this eruption period. During this time, Mount St. Helens had an explosive eruption estimated to be four times as large as the eruption in 1980. This eruption produced large amounts of ash, but did not change the shape of the volcano very much. Our next eruptive phase is called the Pine Creek phase. During this period, Mount St. Helens erupted a set of lava domes that overlapped each other on the summit, creating a rather lumpy looking volcano. The height of the volcano remained the same, about 7,000 feet high. The next eruptive phase is called Castle Creek. After only a brief pause of 300 years, Mount St. Helens began erupting again. The volcano did something very different this time and erupted large amounts of dark colored lava called basalt, which flowed down the sides of the volcano as far as eight miles away from the summit. This basalt formed the famous Ape Cave and other caves around Mount St. Helens. These eruptions transferred the shape of the volcano from a cluster of lava domes to a volcano with smooth sides. The next eruptive period is called the Sugar Bowl. The Sugar Bowl erupted three lava domes that are visible today on the flanks or sides of Mount St. Helens. The material erupted during this period added some girth to the sides but did not significantly change the shape of Mount St. Helens. The next period is called the Kalama period. This was a time of major growth for Mount St. Helens. We could liken it to the teenage years for its big growth spurt. The summit of the volcano reached over 9,000 feet. The volcano erupted lava flows of gray volcanic rock called andesite, which can be seen on the summit of Mount St. Helens today. The next phase was called the Goat Rocks. The eruptions during this time began in 1800 and were witnessed by the indigenous people who lived here as well as newly arriving European settlers. These eruptions did not much change the size of Mount St. Helens, but did erupt lava domes on the flanks. In 1980, Mount St. Helens was famous for the explosive eruption that reduced the height of the volcano down to 8,300 feet. Between 1980 and 1986, in 2004 and 2008, the volcano grew a new lava dome that from the height of the crater floor stands taller than the Empire State Building and is close in elevation to the crater rim. Here's a review of all of the volcanoes We can see that Mount St. Helens changed its shape and style of eruption during these many phases. 
Note that our drawings are models of what we imagine Mount St. Helens to be, and that these models are based on many years of scientific work. Now we will take a look at a model to understand how Mount St. Helens erupted over time. Great, now we are going to take our volcanoes and we're going to lay them out in a timeline to think about how these eruptions relate to one another. Let's take a look at the timeline when we lay out each eruptive phase in Mount St. Helens. We'll begin with the 1980 eruption, Goat Rocks, Kalama, Sugar Bowl, Castle Creek, Pine Creek, Smith Creek. Notice how all of these eruptions are spaced relatively close together. On our timeline, every thousand years is marked with a tick mark. We're going to head down all the way to 13,000 years ago and 11,000 years ago where we had the Swift Creep eruptive period. Moving further down the timeline, once we hit 17,000 years, we have a long eruptive phase called the Cougar eruptive phase, which lasted all the way to 23,000 years. Moving further down the timeline, we begin the Ape Canyon eruptive phase, which was the oldest eruptive phase of Mount St. Helens, beginning around 35,000 years ago. Here we are going to use a green ribbon to represent the duration of the Ape Canyon phase. Moving down in time and further down in time, past 50,000 years ago, past 60,000 years ago, and since our paper timeline has run out, we are going to use a measuring tape. The Ape Canyon eruptive period continues further, further, and further back in time to another measuring tape and further and further back in time. And that is the distance. Let's run the length of our timeline from 300,000 years ago all the way to the present. This is in real time, and this is in half time, so sped up two times as fast. We're still moving. We're still moving forward in time. This is a long eruptive period, and everything represented by the measuring tape on the ground represents the Ape Canyon eruptive phase. There's our timeline, and there's the end of Ape Canyon. Wow. Moving, we have a period of dormancy with no eruptions, and then out to the Cougar eruptive phase in yellow. A small period of dormancy, and then the Swift Creek eruptive phase in blue. A period of dormancy, and then our clustered eruptions, ending with the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980. Let's take a look at our entire timeline. Wow, way down at the end there. What an impressive timeline. I want to give a shout out to our amazing camera woman, Shana Myers, who's a coworker here at the Mount St. Helens Institute, who helped film this impressive timeline. What can we learn from our timeline? Volcanoes can sleep for many hundreds and thousands of years before sometimes reawakening and erupting. Sometimes they erupt within several times within a brief period. We call this an eruptive period, as we saw with some of the eruptive periods at Mount St. Helens, where there were many eruptions happening in a small amount of time. In the Cascade Mountains of the Pacific Northwest, this range includes many active volcanoes, Mount Rainier, Mount Hood, and Mount St. Helens, to name a few. Volcanoes in this range tend to erupt on average once or twice during a period of 100 years. Studying the rate and type of eruption that, the, that happens at these volcanoes can give us information about when these volcanoes might erupt next. There are many people today that live around the volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest and other volcanoes around the world. Studying the evidence for past eruptions gives us a sense of how we can predict what future eruptions may look like. If we look at what happened at Mount St. Helens in 1980, we see that newer eruptions easily destroy the material that was built by past eruptions. Behind me, we can see the crater of Mount St. Helens where an explosive blast pushed out the material that had once built itself into a symmetrical cone-shaped volcano. The explosive and powerful landslide and blast of 1980 gutted out the mountain, leaving a gaping crater that we can see today. Layers of lava flows, ash, and lava domes from past eruptions that had accumulated over, we learned, hundreds of thousands of years, was blown away from the top of a volcano in a matter of tens of seconds. 
When we think about trying to recreate what the volcano looked like in the past, and we understand how one event can be so disruptive to that record, that geologic record, it makes it very tricky for us as we try to imagine what Mount St. Helens looked like back in time. It is important to remember that volcanic eruptions are not only recorded in the rock record, but are also remembered by the people who live nearby. Many communities who live near volcanoes today and in the past have detailed stories describing past eruptions. For us who live near or far from volcanoes, we can learn a lot by paying attention to the stories of rocks and the stories of people. The timeline that we constructed today was built on work that took many, many scientists collaborating together and bringing in research from many places. I'm very grateful for the work of the U.S. Geologic Survey Cascade Volcano Observatory for publishing a timeline of the eruptive history of Mount St. Helens in a clear way that's easy to read and understand. A link to that timeline is listed on our Volcano Tuesday page. A big thank you and shout out also to Pat Pringle, a geologist in Washington here who published an excellent guide to Mount St. Helens also detailing the past eruptive history. Thank you so much, Pat. Finally, a great big thank you to all the sponsors and partners that help make Volcano Tuesdays possible. We at the Mount St. Helens Institute partner with the U.S. Forest Service, the Cowlitz Indian Tribe, and many other volunteers and participants in our programs like you. All of this collaboration makes our work possible. Volcano Tuesdays is also supported by Discover Your Northwest. A big shout out to these folks for donating to us to make this program happen. Finally, take some time this week to build your own timeline, either of your personal history or to reconstruct the timeline of eruptive events at Mount St. Helens. Take a picture and send it to us, post it, we can post it on our website and social media, and we will definitely share next week. Thank you all so much for joining, and I look forward to seeing you next week for Volcano Tuesdays.